Good morning and welcome to Together in God, a media ministry of Grace in St. John's Lutheran Churches of the ELCA. We are excited to share with you today God's message of love and hope for all. Today's service is brought to you by Grace Lutheran Church at 202 West Grand Avenue in Eau Claire. Please join us now in worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who is present, who gives life, and who calls into existence things that do not exist. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you, knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Amen. Receive the good news. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for you. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. For the reign of God and for all that through the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy. O God, our leader and guide, in the waters of baptism, you bring us to new life, to live as your children. Strengthen our faith in your promises, that by your Spirit we may lift up your life to all the world, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I have a picture. I want you to take a look at it. Do you ever go to the dentist's office and they have those highlight magazines where they show you a picture and then you have to find them in the picture? No? Oh my gosh, I feel old. Hmm. Well, they show you a little picture and then you have to find it within a big picture. So I want to see if you can find something that looks like this. This is Jesus when he's 12 years old. Look around the building and see if you can find something that looks a lot like that picture. There you go. They're giving you a clue here, Viv. You see it? Should we walk over there? Why not? So we're going to talk for a while, not today, but each week I'm going to talk about different windows and what's going on in them. Back a long time ago, not only children couldn't read before they went to school, but the adults couldn't read before they went to, to school because they never got a chance to. And so the way they told, taught people Bible stories was with pictures. And this is a story of one time, do you know the expression, what would Jesus do and then you're supposed to do what Jesus has done? This would be an example where that's not a good idea. Jesus went with his family on a trip to the capital of his country, and when they went home, he didn't get in the car. 
Well, it wasn't a car, but he didn't get in the car. Three days they lost track of Jesus when he was 12 years old. He went, ah, the little home alone thing, right? He was in the big temple, and he was teaching uh, the, the leader, the religious leaders, even though he was only 12 years old. Let's go back. Because this picture, I think that, I don't know if, the, if both pieces of art are made by the same person, or if one person stole from the other one, but look at it. It's, I think it's the same Jesus, but here you see the guys he's, he's leading. They're old. They're like as old as I am. Hmm? They're younger? They're younger than me? Oh, oh, that hurts. See, I told you, you can make people laugh when you say funny things in the children's sermon. Yep, so these young pups, these young whippersnappers are being taught by 12-year-old Jesus because he spent so much time with God, he knows things. And so we have a window to remind us that we should listen to children. So maybe in a few years you'll be here teaching us stuff. Or maybe you'll just start right now, because that'd be a great thing to do. Thank you all for coming up here. Have a good day. Today's reading is taken from the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the first verse. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. This will be the passage I'll be preaching on, and it's the passage about Jesus, and we always like to pay special attention when that's the case. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Or another translation would be born again. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? 
Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What, a bo- what is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen. Yet you don't receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from the God who so loved the world that he sent. Jesus, to live and dwell among us. Amen. There's a challenge in listening to this story for those of us in the 21st century, and that is for almost 2,000 years, we have treated the word Pharisee as though it means hypocrite. If you look at a dictionary, I looked at my online dictionary, second entry is Pharisee means hypocrite. What's important to know is that is not the way it was understood in the time when Jesus lived. Pharisees uh, were people looked up to. If you were going to divide the world between good and bad in kind of a simplistic way, they would be in the good column. They were people so dedicated to God that they wanted to figure out how do you live faithfully in every moment of your life. What does that look like in great detail? And so it's important to realize that when John tells this story, he is lifting up someone that he assumes everyone looks up to so that those of us who maybe aren't quite so high can know that even those people have struggles and don't instantly understand. And as a teacher, I always appreciated when I had one of those people in my class. Somebody would raise their hand and express what was confusing to everybody else in the room. It gave everybody an opportunity to hear the clarification, not just the person who raised their hand. John constantly has people raising their hand in his gospel and saying, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'm confused. Nicodemus is somebody we're meant to look up to and to feel okay about the questions that we bring to Jesus because this highly trained man is doing that. Are there signs in the text that we should trust Nicodemus? I think so. First of all, simply that he's a Pharisee. In fact, some people say the closest thing in Jesus' day to describe who he was was he was a Pharisee. He acted like a Pharisee. So there's that. Second, he comes to Jesus and refers to him as rabbi. That's an even higher honorary title that he applies. It means, of the people I see around me, I trust that you understand the tradition so thoroughly that you can speak to us about how to live in our own day. You know the stories, you know the laws, you know the traditions. I can trust you. What's more, uh, he comes at night. Now here, I, there are different ways that interpreters go, as can happen in any story. 
And some people say, oh, it's night. He's sneaking in. He doesn't want anyone to know that he's interested in talking to Jesus. I would read that differently. Pharisees had full-time jobs that were not, they weren't pastors. <laughs> they were people with ordinary jobs. So when did they do their work of study and learning from scriptures? They did it in the night when their 10 to 12 hours of work had ended. And so, to me, his going there in the night isn't saying, and Nicodemus snuck there when no one was looking. It's saying, and Nicodemus took the time that he'd set aside to learn the things from God, of God, and he went to the rabbi Jesus to learn them. And then finally, I see it as a positive sign that Nicodemus asks so many questions. In the Bible, Faithful people are constantly asking questions. Sometimes, at least in some groups of Christians, it's presented as though if you have any questions to ask, then you're not faithful. Within the long scriptural tradition, I would argue it's the opposite. I can refer you to my blog uh, on our webpage where I've written, I think, three different things about how God doesn't ask us to check our minds and our imagination at the door when we enter our space of worship. So, I've tried to establish that Nicodemus is somebody we're meant to admire. But I've also said he's somebody who gets confused. And we see that pretty clearly in, in the story. I think his confusion is serving our confusion and allowing Jesus to speak to us. So what is his confusion? Jesus is trying to speak of something big and mysterious, the kingdom of God. And so he uses symbolic languages. He says, you must be uh, born anew, or uh, born again. Or later he says, born of breath, born of water. And Nicodemus takes this symbolic language, which is what Jesus needs to speak about something so mysterious and immense, and he tries to get it into something manageable. He treats it as though it's a literal description. He says, how can somebody crawl into the womb of their mother again and be born again? So he takes the expansive language that Jesus is using and tries to make it into something smaller. You with me? With me? So it's interesting. The Gospel of John does this constantly. I don't know if people know that there's a whole Gospel dedicated to critiquing use of literal, literal interpretations of what Jesus says and inviting us to a more expansive imagination. I'm going to do a little sidebar. Uh, if you go home or, you know, slip your phone out during the, uh, during the offering or during when you're waiting for other people to take communion and you Google birth in the ancient world, you'll see some ancient images, so not the medieval ones that are portraying what they thought it was like, but the ancient world ones, what you'll see is not women lying on their back. You'll see women giving birth standing, squatting, or my favorite ones is they're on a birthing stool. They're sitting on a stool, with, and, what, and some of them have like three women kind of surrounding them <laughs> and supporting them while another woman is there to catch the child when it's born. What this means, you didn't know you were going to get a little gynecological lecture here uh, at church today, so that's a bonus material for today. But what it means is, in the ancient world, people were born not the way I, ex I understand it, in our context where you're born horizontally, you were born from above. Women used gravity to facilitate their delivery of children. And so, maybe it's a little easier to understand why uh, Nicodemus gets confused. He wants to say, he, he says, Jesus, what you're saying is literally not true. And it's not true if you're taking it literally. But Jesus isn't speaking literally. If, if it's literal, Nicodemus is right. It's like one of two things in life that is distributed equitably. We each get one birth, and nobody gets out of here alive, right? In between, not so equally distributed, right? So he's right. If, 
If it means a literal birth, Nicodemus is right. But Jesus is speaking in expansive symbolic language. So what is he saying? What is Jesus saying? He says, you cannot see and enter the kingdom of God unless if you're born from above. Born from above. It's a maternal image of God bringing us into new life by giving birth. Right? I have never, to this date, seen a stained glass window which sought to capture this image of God, right? the birthing God image. But that's what it is. And it's, it's not only the, the being born from above piece, but the other aspects. You're born of water, and one of the key indicators, right? Breaking water and breath, right? That command, breathe, breathe, breathe. All this is rolled up in this image that, of what Jesus is trying to expand, uh, explain that's so expansive. So what does that mean? What does this symbolic language invite us to think about? Well, first of all, birth is God's work, not ours. None of us requested to be born, I don't think. Right? That, what, that depended on someone else. But nothing in our life has had a greater impact than the fact that we were born. Everything that followed after it depended on that. Our, our birth into the kingdom of God depends entirely on God. And when God does that, everything after that changes. What's more, to me at least, the image suggests that this is a painful process, not just for us, but for God. That God giving birth to us results in suffering and pain in the same way that my birth resulted in birth pangs for my mom. Right? That shouldn't surprise us. We worship uh, a God who is said to be revealed in a cross, where pain is a central element what that is, and so it's not surprising. And there's, in those, all those traditions Jesus knows, there's other traditions that do this very, even more explicitly, I think. In Isaiah 42, through the prophet, God says, I groan like a woman in labor. I gasp and pant. So, I think that uh, we get to overhear this conversation so that we can be invited to expansive thinking and expansive use of our imagination about the intimate, sacrificial ways that God is involved in our lives. If the birth image is extended a little further, we could say, well, it's a bit of travail, this journey for us too, <laughs> right? Leaving the comfort of the womb and being pushed into the world. But maybe it's helpful to remember it's the world that God so loves that we're introduced into. So that we, as we approach 12 years old, can learn to walk and follow Jesus on his own. Not only follow what he's saying, but follow him in our life. God, the breath of God, this breaking of waters, uh, this laboring Nicodemus into something new, is not the end of Nicodemus' story. I don't know if you knew, he appears two other times. Uh, in the Gospel of John. It's on the front of the bulletin. But the first time he appears, or the second time he appears, he's defending Jesus when some people want to just rush to an execution without a fair trial. He's saying, well, let's remember due process, y'all. We don't work that way. The man deserves a hearing. And the next time he appears is when Jesus is crucified and laid in the grave. He shows up with spices to anoint the body of Jesus. In the traditions of that time, uh, the spices would be about five pounds of spices, which is kind of hefty, right? He shows up with 75 pounds, <laughs> 75 pounds of spices, right? It's like if you go to a funeral and you're used to seeing the five bouquets around the casket and you show up and the entire front of the church has been filled because someone like Nicodemus felt so extravagantly loved by Jesus 
that he had to respond with the same kind of extravagance. John tells us a story so that we can go on a journey with Nicodemus, this person we can look up to but who also has questions. And I pray that we might be carried on the breath of his journey to new life. Let us pray. God of new birth, may we come to life through your breathing spirit and be born from above. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you have given us minds and imaginations. Help us to understand the way that they participate in our understanding of your living word. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. God of all, we pray for those suffering from the coronavirus and those seeking to minimize the damage it causes. Be with your children wherever disease and bodily breakdown threatens people's well-being. Lord, in your mercy. God, who so loves the whole world, desiring that we know love, love's embrace rather than condemnation, let this people be a community where all encounter a gracious welcome and loving attention. Open our hearts to those who have experienced rejection among your people and in their families. Help us to love the world as full-heartedly as you do. Lord, in your mercy. God of this world, tend and care for our fragile planet. Teach us to hold its life in, health, in a healthy balance. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being part of our Together in God worship service. Your prayers and financial support are always deeply appreciated. Please tune in again next Sunday at the same time or join us in person at 10 a.m. in the church. Remember the 9 a.m. coffee hour. Go in peace, serve the Lord.